Hello and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope that the service you're about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We want to connect with you. We know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on a Tuesday afternoon or maybe a Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. And that's the beauty of On Demand and that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we want to be able to include you as part of our church family and to help you take your next step wherever that may be. Let us know that you're here by clicking on one of the buttons that's popping up on your screen right now. Now, no matter who you are, where you are, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that you'll hopefully be able to use in order to live life in a better way. And we pray that as you live out God's word, that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy our service. Good to see you all this morning, stepping into a time of community and a time to rally around some songs and worship together. I want to invite you not to just listen, not just to be here, but to participate in, in, in what we get to offer to God, this adoration, this, this praise to our King. So glad that you're here. I invite you to stand as we sing these powerful melodies, these scriptures of truth. Let's go. No 
nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Yes, he does. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. No mighty fortress, you go before us. Come on. Nothing can stand against the power of our God.
take your seat. Thank you for worshiping, raising your voice with us this morning. We're going to go into a time of communion. It's going to look a little bit different today. The, the band and I are going to sing a song over you for communion. It'll be a little bit of extended time, a reflective time. But I want to encourage you to continue, continue to pray, to meditate, to think of what this moment means for our faith, for our salvation, that we have been restored back to the Father. The goodness of God is amazing. And this, this next song is gonna talk a lot about mercy. What we deserve is punishment. What we deserve is separation from God. But God has st st stood in that gap and because of him, we are restored, we are connected back to him. So that's what this song's all about. It's just a testimony of our faith. And so we're gonna sing that over you, just encourage you to listen to the words. And then at one point I'm gonna 
offer you uh, a moment to, to step into this song, step into the melody, and to sing and shout this song with us. So go ahead and take communion now. Yes. 
You man, go ahead and take your seat. We have a baptism. Check, check it out. Just love, love those words and how they wash over us and how we're in this moment. Randy, I, I just love that you're here. You're leading your family as a, an example. And and you said it's, it's the people and Jesus that brought you to this moment. And I'm, I pray that you'll never forget this moment of what it means for you. It's the time and place where God isn't just with you. He's in you. He's not just, you know, forgotten your past. He's, he's forgiven it. So you repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my Lord. As my Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Because your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hi, we are the deputies. I'm Jenny, this is my husband, Michael, and we have been attending Victory for about four years now. And we would just like to share a little bit about how faithful God has been in our finances over the years. Several years ago, 2016 or so, um, our finances were a mess. And the church we were attending at the time offered FPU. We took it and that changed our lives and gave us the ability to be disciplined in our giving and with our finances. At the beginning of the year, we determine how much we're going to give at the Easter and Christmas offering. We plan that out at the beginning of the year and just start putting money back throughout the entire year so that we have that. And that's what we did this year. We planned for Easter, we planned for Christmas. And as Josh was going through his above and beyond uh, messages, we got challenged to go a little bit higher than our comfort level. And we determined how much we were gonna give and we it was above our comfort level. It was definitely where if we do this and God doesn't show up, we're gonna be in trouble. And then about a week and a half before Christmas, what happened? Yeah, it was right bef about two weeks before Christmas, Mickey and I were heading up to my mom's to make Christmas candy, you know, do all the fun Christmas things and my check engine light started flashing on my car. And so we pulled over and, you know, I looked up to see what it could be, thought, okay, we'll add some oil, see if that helps. Long story short, it didn't, and we had to have it towed. And to a place we'd never been, didn't know anybody there. And they called Michael on Monday morning and said, hey, it's gonna be this amount. We're like, ugh, that was not expected. Okay, but because of Ramsey, and FPU, it was gonna be an inconvenience. It wasn't going to be a major life event, it was just gonna be inconvenient. But still, it was like a punch in the gut. And Michael said, you know why this happened, right? Because we've made this commitment to above and beyond. I said, yeah, right, uh, you were absolutely right. Don't like it, but you're right. And not even an hour later, I got an email from our superintendent at the schools and said that an appreciation to support staff, we were going to be given a year in stipend or a year in loyalty bonus. And it was based on years of service. And I figured out how much mine would be. And it was going to be almost exactly the amount of what they had said that the car repair was going to be. So I immediately called Mike. I'm like, guess what? This happened. And so we were very excited and then got the actual bill for the car repair. And it was less than they had said. So it was even better. Um, and it was just, it was so neat. I was crying, sitting in my, you know, in a classroom, reading the email, just crying, amazed, even though I shouldn't be, at how faithful God was and always is. And just how he has rewarded and blessed us because we chose to answer the call to go above and beyond. I just want to encourage people that even if it's hard, if you feel the tug on your heart to do it, do it. Let God show up. Let God show His power and prove to you again and again that He will carry you through. What, what an incredible story uh, just to see a, a family right here in, in our Victory family that uh, where God just showed up. It's, it is incredible. Every time we're faithful, God shows up. He shows up every single time. 
And you know who doesn't always show up? Josh Cadwell. <laughs> I, know, I know that's probably what you're thinking. You're like, where's Josh this morning? Well, he's not here. Uh, my name is Greg Coble, and I'll give you a little bit uh, a brief history, just for those of you uh, who I haven't met yet. I'm only going to tell you the good stuff. I'm going to save the bad stuff in case they ask me to speak again, and then I've got some good sermon illustrations. But uh, the good stuff, Kat and I, my wife Kat and I, we've been attending here for about three years. Uh, this is our second time around Victory. About 20 years ago, we attended here um, for about five years before we left to help plant a church in Greenwood. And uh, we served in that church for a while. And then I had an opportunity to actually step on staff and work in full-time ministry. And for those of you who do know me, you know that that just uh, is more evidence that God does in fact work in mysterious ways. So it's, it's absolutely true. Um, now I actually work with an organization that coaches and consults Christian CEOs and business owners. And we just support and encourage and challenge those folks to build great businesses so that they can have an eternal impact in the lives of the people who work in their organizations. And I love what I do. It's a great season of life for me. Uh, today, I actually get to close out the series that we've been in. It's called The Beginner's Guide to Predicting Your Future. And if you were here the first week, you might remember that Josh started this series with this question. What if you could predict your own future? What if you could predict your future? Would you have more confidence would you have less anxiety about what your, your, what's going to happen with your future goals and hopes and dreams? We think you would. And, and hopefully if you've been here and you've heard any uh, of the talks in this series, you're starting to believe that you can predict your own future. Now, the reason we believe that it's true, at least to some extent, is this simple principle. It's called the principle of the path. And the principle of the path just simply says this, direction determines destination. And we know that's true. This isn't anything new. It's true in every single area of our lives. We know that we, were, we will end up wherever the path we're on takes us. Doesn't matter what our intentions are. The path that we're on is leading somewhere and we'll eventually get there if we stay on that path. That's the principle of the path. It doesn't matter what our intentions are. As a matter of fact, the word intention, that one word was so important that we actually added it to the definition. And we said the definition now is our direction, not our intention, determines our destination. I want to tell you a story. Kat and I just uh, went to New York City back in December. This is a picture of us standing at the base of the Statue of Liberty on a beautiful early December morning. Uh, I'd never been to the Big Apple, so we wanted to take all the sights and sounds in, wanted to see everything we could. The very first night we were there, we decided to ride the subway down to Times Square. And as soon as we got off the subway and walked up onto the street level, uh, we took it all in. I mean, all the lights, uh, it was Christmas time, so we got to see the, the big tree in Rockefeller Center. Um, we, uh, we watched all the people, that was so much fun. We ate dinner down at Times Square, and then we went to a show. And after a long day of travel and all the activities, we decided to take the subway back to our hotel. So we find the, the subway station in Times Square, we walk in, Kat is walking in front of me. And she goes to the turnstile. Here's what the New York City turnstiles look like. She walked up to the turnstile and she took her phone and she tapped it on the top of the turnstile. Now I have to tell you that because this is a very important part of the story. You see, earlier in the day, we had downloaded a payment app to Kat's phone so that we could both ride the subway and just have one mode of payment uh, through that app. So when she tapped her phone on the, t on the turnstile, the light turned green and she walked through. She was on the inside, but she left me on the outside. So I called out to her. I said, hey, I'm going to need your phone. So she turns around. She hands it to me with these simple instructions. Just tap it. So I take her phone. I tap it on the turnstile. Nothing happens. There's a little light that's supposed to change to green. So it lets you know that the turnstile is unlocked and you can go in. No green light. I, I look at the app. I make sure it's open. I tap it again. Nothing. So I get Kat's attention. I call her back over. I hand her the phone. I said, I don't think this thing's working. She looks at it. She shrugs. She says, just tap it. <laughs> so I take the phone back. I tap it. Nothing happens. 
Of course, she knew that, right? If something had happened, if just tap it would have worked, I wouldn't even be telling you the story. But I just tapped it, nothing happened. But this time, I noticed there was a notification that said face ID was required. <laughs> so, and let me paint the big picture for you. We're in the Times Square subway station. We are not the only two there. There are people everywhere. It's loud, it's chaotic. The, these turnstiles, they're not just used to let you into the subway. They're actually where people come out of the subway. So there's literally tons of people and everybody else looks like they know what they're doing. But here we are, cats on the inside, I'm on the outside, and we're handing this cell phone back and forth. Thankfully, it didn't have a pink case. That would have made it even worse. But as she comes back toward me, I get her attention. As she comes back, as I try to hand her the phone, now I have to tell you, I'm not proud of what happened next. Cat and I normally communicate really, really well, but not this night. Not in the middle of the Times Square subway station with all the people, all the commotion, all the noise. As I tried to hand the phone back to Kat, she looked me square in my eyes and said, just tap it. <laughs> now something started to well up inside of me. <laughs> and I said back to her and really kind of shouted, I did. I tapped it. I tapped it like 10 times. Slight exaggeration. To which she calmly replied, huh, well, that should have worked. <laughs> well, again, something's welling up inside of me, right? And so I kind of growl out these next words. I said, but it didn't. It didn't work. So this time, Kat comes back. She takes the phone from my hand. She reaches back over the turnstile. She taps it. Nothing happens. She looks at the phone, triggers the face ID, taps it again, and poof, green light. <laughs> so now I'm in, but I'm mad. And I've growled at her, so I hurt her feelings. We're both frustrated, and we just walk silently through the Times Square subway station, not making eye contact, not saying a word, looking for the, the sign that says 86th Street. So we find the sign, we walk down onto the platform, we wait for the train in total silence. The train comes, we board, we take our seats, still not making eye, eye contact, not a word. The train starts to roll, it finally makes it to the 86th Street station. We walk off the train, onto the platform, up the stairs, onto the street, and the silence is broken. You see, as we looked around, nothing looked familiar. We were lost. We had gotten on the train to 86th Street, but we'd gotten on the red line, which takes you to the west side of Central Park. We needed to be on the yellow line that takes you to the east side of Central Park. That's where our hotel was. We were two miles away from our hotel. And the only way to walk there was to walk right through the middle of Central Park after dark. And neither one of us was brave enough to do that. H have you ever been there? Have you ever been lost? Have you ever had a moment where you stopped and you looked around and you asked yourself, what happened? How did we get here? You see, for Kat and I, we're standing on the right street, but we're in the wrong neighborhood. And that's what we're asking ourselves. We're saying, what happened? How did we get here? I know you've probably had that experience. I believe we all have. And it may not have been a physical place. You may not have been physically lost. Maybe you were on some sort of relational path and you missed the red flags and you, you got to a point and you were like, what happened? How did I get here? Maybe it was an emotional path or maybe a path of addiction for some of us where we, we got to a point where we stopped and we looked around and we, we decided the path that we were on was not going to get us where we wanted to go. You know, coming out of the ministry world, I've heard lots of stories and I've talked with lots of people who've had this experience for themselves. They're wandering through life, not paying attention. And they get to a point where they start to feel lost and confused and they realize the path that they're on is not going to get them where they want to go. 
And then they come to my office or they invite me for a coffee meeting and they just pour their hearts out and they tell me their stories. And as I listen to those stories, I came to this, this simple conclusion. It's easy to get lost. And sometimes we can be lost and not even feel lost. I mean, think back to the subway story. When did Kat and I actually feel lost? We didn't feel lost until we got to the street level and nothing looked familiar. But when did we get lost? Well, we got lost back in the Times Square subway station when we started to follow the wrong signs. We were lost when we were standing on the platform. We were lost the entire train ride. We just didn't feel lost. We were lost like 30 minutes. We felt lost about 30 seconds. Because as soon as we started to feel lost, we, de we developed a new plan. And that plan included an Uber to get us from where we were to where we wanted to go. It's so easy to get lost. Sometimes you don't feel lost. As I started to think about this message today, and I started to think about maybe the first time that Kat and I ever had the conversation where those questions came out. What happened? How did we get here? And I remembered back, we were probably five or six years into our marriage. And we had wandered down this financial path. We weren't paying attention to where our money was going. And uh, we had, um, we'd racked up a bunch of debt. We, we had a financial mess. We were about $100,000 in consumer debts, car loans and, and um, credit card payments and personal loans, about $100,000. And we sat down one night and we, we just looked at each other and realized that we were lost. And until that point, we didn't even realize we were on the wrong path. But this one incident, it, it was really just one question, caused us to stop and to evaluate where we were financially speaking and we just determined the financial path we were on was not going to get us to the financial future that we wanted. And so this morning, I, I need to ask you, when you look at your financial path, is it possible that you're lost? Is it possible that if you just stopped and took the time to look around and evaluate where you are financially that you might determine that you're not on the path that's going to get you where you want to go for your financial future. Listen, I'm, I'm not making any judgment. I don't know. I don't know if you're lost or not. But I do know from my own personal experience and the experience of a lot of other people I've talked with, it's easy to get lost and we can be lost and not feel lost. So, so maybe you're lost. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're on the right financial path. I, I don't know. But either way, you have to come to the same realization and you have to face it the same way Kat and I did. There was this one thing that we had to wrestle with, and that's this, how we handle our money it's not just a financial thing. It's a spiritual thing. Everything that we can do with money, the, the spending and the debt we incur, the saving, the investing, even when we give it away, those aren't just financial things. They're all spiritual things. Have you ever considered that God is concerned with how you handle your money? God cares. God cares what you do with your money. I mean, God never intended for money to be a source of stress or anxiety in our lives. Yet surveys show us that over 50% of the people in this room this morning would say that every day they feel some sort of financial pressure. God never intended for money to cause fights or to divide families or to cause divorce. But for decades, one of the number one causes of divorce has been listed as money fights and money problems. 
Listen, that's not God's plan for you, and it's not God's plan for your money. I believe God wants us to have money. As a matter of fact, I believe this is true. God wants you to have money. He just doesn't want your money to have you. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, I want you to open it up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we'll get there in just a minute. But as we move in that direction, I first need to step back to chapter 5, and I want to set the stage for you. I want you to understand uh, where Jesus is uh, and what he's saying when we get to the the verse we're going to focus on this morning. In chapter 5, it tells us that a, a large crowd is starting to gather around Jesus. And he begins to teach them. And when he starts to teach them, he starts by telling them the types of people who can expect to be blessed by God. He starts with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. And he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Now he goes on from there and he starts to talk about his expectations for his followers. He says, if you're going to be my follower you're going to need to be different. And he compares his followers to salt and light, two things that can make a big difference. Then he goes on to say, if you're going to be my follower, not only are you going to, be, going to, to need to stand out, you're actually going to need to obey the law. But you're going to need to obey the law differently than the t- people who are actually teaching you the law today. Now that would have gotten the people's attention. Because I expect they're they're probably leaning in and they're agreeing with Jesus and they're there and that probably caused them to stop and just ears perk up. They didn't understand what he meant. And what he was trying to say was, um, and we see it in verse five, this one particular statement, or in chapter five, verse 20 rather. He says, "I I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And what he was trying to get his listeners to understand that day was, these people who are teaching you the law, they know the law so well that they can actually behave in a way that makes them look righteous. But it doesn't make them righteous. He said, if you're going to be a follower of mine, I want your righteousness to begin on the inside. I want your righteousness to begin in your heart. That's the most important thing. That's where righteousness begins. Righteousness is uh, part of your devotion and your affection toward the one you're following. That's where true righteousness begins, in the heart. Then we get into Matthew chapter 6, the the verses we're going to look at today. And we'll start with verse 19. Jesus is beginning to talk to his listeners for the very first time about money and possessions. And this is the way he starts it. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them. And where thieves break in and steal, store your your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Now, I have to pause here for just a second because a lot of people, some church people included, believe that followers of Jesus should not be wealthy. They think somehow that money is evil. I don't believe that. I don't believe money is good or evil. I think money is just an object. Money can be used for good, but it can also be used for evil. Money is a lot like this brick. This brick is just an object. But if you put this brick in the hands of someone who's angry, an angry protester, for example, they can cause a lot of damage with this brick. They can, they can cause a lot of destruction with this brick. But if you put this brick in the hands of a skilled craftsman, a skilled bricklayer, he'll take this brick and more bricks like it, and he'll lay them uh, row after row, brick after brick, until he builds a a school or a hospital or maybe even a church building. You see, it's not the brick. The brick is just an object. What matters is the motive and the desire of the person who holds the object in their hand. And I think maybe that's why Jesus says what he says next. I think he basically says, this is what I know about the human condition. 
This is what I know about what's going to happen in in your motives. And, And he says this in verse 21, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Do you see the pattern here? He started teaching the crowd in verse five and he said, blessed are the pure in heart. He started to tell folks, if you're going to be my follower, I want your righteousness to come from your heart, to be an overflow of your heart. And then when he starts to talk about money and possessions, he goes right back to the heart. And here's the reason I think that Jesus did that. I believe that Jesus knew that the things we treasure here on earth would become the number one competition for our hearts. Did you know in scripture, in the Bible, there are over 2,800 verses that deal with money and possessions. In the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the, the gospels that, that, that contain the words of Jesus, one in every 10 verses deals with money and possessions. You see, Jesus talked about money, but when he talked about money, he didn't talk about the money. The money wasn't the thing. He talked about the motive because Jesus wants to know that his followers have a devoted heart. And if anything gets in the way of our relationship with him, it becomes a problem. That's why it's, 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 a, it's too important for us not to talk about today. Because Jesus, what he wants from us, he wants the complete love and affection of the hearts of all of his followers. And when we're on the right financial path, listen, you have money, but your money doesn't have you. So how do we get there? How do we get to a place where we're on a financial path where we have money, but our money doesn't have us? How do we get to a place where uh, the way we handle our money and the path that we're on is a reflection of our true desire and our heart and our affection for Jesus? Well, there are five practical steps I want to share with you today. Uh, We'll run through these pretty quickly. The first one, you need to live on a written budget. Live on a written budget. How many of you have done dumb stuff with money? How many have done dumb stuff with money? Me too. You know what keeps me from doing more dumb stuff with money? My written budget. When I first heard the word budget, I felt like it was binding and restrictive. And then I came across the words of author John Maxwell, and he said, a budget is simply telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. I was like, ah, okay. So what we started to do was write down how we plan to spend our money every month before the month began. And we did that for 30 days and then for 60 days and then for 90 days. And we changed our habits around money and we started following the the written guidelines that we created for ourselves. And at the end of the 90 day period, Kat and I felt like we got a raise. We didn't make any more money. We weren't earning anything more, but we knew where our money was going. If you want to win with money, if you want to be on the right financial path, you have to live on a written budget. Number two, you have to avoid debt. You have to avoid debt. You've probably heard uh, of King Solomon. King Solomon was one of the wisest men to ever live. And King Solomon wrote down a bunch of uh, nuggets of wisdom that he wanted generation after generation uh, to be able to to read and understand. And we we find those nuggets of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Well, in Proverbs 22, 7, King Solomon actually talks about personal finance. And what he says is this. He says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. The borrower is slave to the lender. Now listen, these days, chains come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And it doesn't matter what it is. If we have our money obligated to payments on anything, we lose the freedom to use that money anywhere else. Last year, the average car payment was $628. 
That's $628 you couldn't use to buy birthday gifts. $628 that you couldn't use to take a vacation or to give to a charity or to help a friend or a family member or a neighbor who lost their job. You see, when we obligate our money to make our debt payments, we lose the freedom to use our money any other way. The borrower is slave to the lender. Number three, we have to build and foster high quality relationships. Why is this so important? You've probably heard the phrase, money changes people. Listen, I don't think money changes anybody. Money is just a magnifier. Money just simply makes us more of what we already are. If you're a big jerk when you're broke, you're going to be an even bigger jerk when you get rich. If you have a spending problem when you don't have any money, when you start to have some money in the bank, you can rack up all kinds of regret when your spending gets out of control. See, money is just a magnifier. It makes us more of what we already are. So it's so important that if we're going to win with money, we need to be in relationship with people who are on the path financially that we want to be on. Do you want to be more generous? Hang around with generous people. Do you want to be more disciplined? Find some disciplined people to put in your life. And listen, don't wait. Start right now. Don't wait until you need community to build community because if you do, it will be too late. Find a group of people right now who are dedicated to head in the same financial path that you want to be on. Number four, we have to save and invest. Save and invest. Did you know that 40% of Americans have zero dollars saved for an emergency? 70% of families in the U.S. today are living paycheck to paycheck. And that's self-reported. That means that most of the families in here today, if they had a $1,000 emergency, many of you would talk about bankruptcy. Listen, we have to save some money if we're going to, to win with money. And we need to start small. Start small. Just start putting money back until you get to about $1,000 because $1,000 will take the edge off an emergency. And then as you begin uh, living on a budget and paying off your debt, then you can increase that, uh, that, that saving to about maybe three or six months of expenses. And you may wonder, why, why three, three to six months? Is there something magic about that? The only reason I would say three to six months is just in case we ever have a repeat of the year 2020. If you've got a little money and something happens, it's really not an if, we know something's going to happen. It's not if, but when something happens. If you have some savings, it just becomes an inconvenience, right? Number five. This is, this is the place where it gets a lot of fun. Number five, we have to be incredibly generous. When we get to the point where we've lived on a budget and we've paid off our debt and we've started to build high quality relationships, we've built up a nest egg and we've got some savings, then we can get our heads up and we can start looking around at ways to be outrageously generous. And listen, generosity changes things. Generosity can change people's eternity. You see, the only reason we give in the first place is because God, because God gave to us first, right? In John three sixteen. It says, God loved us so much that he gave his son. So the only reason that we have a desire to give is because we want to model our heavenly father. And when we become generous, we have an opportunity to share that love, the love of God with other people, and it can change their eternity. Probably even bigger than that, though, generosity can change you. When you become generous you start to think of and interact with money in a different way. Here, here's the way we say it around here. Anyone can give, the discipline can tithe, but being generous requires faith and trust in God to provide. I wanted to illustri illustrate for you that, that faith and trust in God concept. And the best way that I could think to do it was to, uh, to show you a mathematic formula. 
Now, we've been taught in school that 100% is as much as we can get right. That's the full amount. But listen, in God's economy, this is what that mathematic formula looks like. 100% is actually less than 90% plus God. See, when, when it comes to personal finance for followers of Jesus, we have to get to the point where we put our faith and trust in God to provide. And we believe that begins with the tithe. That, believes, that begins with bringing 10%, which means we live on 90% plus God. But it doesn't necessarily stop there. The, the, the mathematic formula probably should have looked more like this. 100% is less than X plus God, where X represents the percentage that God leads you to live on. For some people, it may be 80%. For some, 70%, and you give the rest away. I've heard people who live on 10% plus God. Now that takes a lot of faith and trust in God to provide. You may remember back in December, Josh asked us to consider bringing what he called a one-time sacrificial to you gift. And on the day that that, that those gifts were given, we, we found out later, just a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, that collectively we brought $155,000 for the Above and Beyond campaign. And all of that money, 100% of it, was to be used to fund the ministries here at Victory, the ministries that are connecting people back to God, the ministries that are changing lives. And we celebrated that, and it sounded great until I stopped to do the math. And when I looked at the number of people who were here and the average income for the the places where our church buildings are located, and I I took the number that was given and backed out all of the data, what, what I found was that for every $100 that was earned by the people who were here in attendance the day we collected the Above and Beyond campaign, For every $100, we sacrificially gave three cents. Now, does that sound sacrificial to you? Now, Josh, he may never tell you this, but in case you've forgotten, Josh ain't here. I don't think it sounds sacrificial. It doesn't sound sacrificial to me. It sounds problematic to me. And listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not condemning you. I don't want you to feel guilty about it. I, it just tells me there's a problem. And I don't think it's a problem of greed. I don't think anybody in here is greedy. I don't think it's a problem of apathy. I don't think it's that we just don't care. I don't think anybody here is disconnected from the vision of our church to see people come back to God. I think the lack of generosity in the Above and Beyond campaign is simply this. It's an indicator of the financial path many of us are on, and that's a path with no margin. You see, we've put our faith and trust not in God, but we put our faith and trust in a financial system that is designed to take it away from us. And we've gotten to the point where we don't have any margin and it feels like a couple hundred dollars is a lot of money. And I've I've heard it said this way, where there's no margin, there's no ministry. And we can't allow that to happen. It's too important to get this right. So I want to end with, with just a couple of questions. The first one is, what if we got this right? Just this one thing, what if... What would happen for the kingdom of God? What would happen for the kingdom of God if the children of God were to get on the right financial path? What would happen for the kingdom of God if the children of God were on the right financial path? What would happen in your home if you were completely debt free? For my friends, Jeff and Lauren, it meant that when they got a phone call, they didn't hesitate, not one second, to take in three more kids and turn their family of five into a family of eight. What would it look like in our churches if our ministries were fully funded? We would hear story after story of life change that was happening because people's physical and emotional and spiritual needs were being met. 
and they were being connected back to God. What would it look like in our communities if the people of victory were known as being incredibly generous? And people would just be coming to us and they'd be saying, why? Why are you helping me? Why are you doing this? And we'd be able to say, it's because God first loved us and he loves you too. You know, if we just got this one thing right, it would start a ripple effect that would allow us to change the entire world. Earlier, we sang a song and we said, God, there's nothing better than you. What if we truly believed that? And what if that was a reflection of our hearts? not just something we sang, but it was truly what we were committing to. What if we said, God, there's nothing better than you, not our house, not our car, not the security we feel from having money in the bank. God, there is nothing better than you. I've asked Aaron and the team to come back up and lead us in part of that song. And what I invite you to do this morning, if you're ready for that to be true for you, if you're ready for that that to be a true reflection of your heart and your relationship with Jesus as it relates to your personal finances, I just invite you to stand up and sing this thing out loud and sing this to God and make this your commitment to him. Would you stand and sing? Oh, there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's no Nothing is better than you. Well, I've searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along. that that is truly a reflection of your heart, that that's truly where you want to be when it comes to your relationship with God and your relationship with your personal finances. Would you just pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for speaking to us today on a, on a difficult subject. Thank you, Father, for drawing our hearts to you. God, I just pray for anybody here whose next step is to uh, just to stop and consider whether or not they might be lost financially. And then to have the courage to engage in the things that will help them get on the right path, be with the right people. God, I just pray for the courage, the passion, whatever it takes to get us all to to take that next step. Because Father, as always, we want to live lives that bring credibility to the life and the message of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. 
Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe that we all have a next step, and we pray that God uses what you've experienced here today to stir something in your life and to lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity in the work that God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.live slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time.